Maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. You know, I, I sit there and looked at my... Uh, my like uh, uh, outline for the show today and did so many subjects that barely touched the surface of sports and uh, they touched the surface of sports but like the Orioles losing streak and Urban Meyer and Paul Feinbaum and uh, certainly the Maryland situation just it's just sports is like in, in change in flux right now and to help me analyze it of course is my frequent co-host, good friend, and all-time Terrapin football fan, Mr. Wayne Viner. Wayne, welcome in. Good morning, Bruce. Yeah, we don't have a lot of games to talk about yet. Well, the Redskins played last night. You got a Ravens game tonight, but they're still not a games. week away for this actual football. They're not games, and the Redskins delved again into Adrian Peterson, you know, the off-character to, to come back and... Uh, try and help the team, but he looked like a first-class runner yesterday, a little bit of what I watched. Yeah, but, he did, and uh, the quarterback, Alex Smith, didn't look like a first-class player, so it's probably going to be a longer season in Washington than it will be in Baltimore. i tell you the weirdest thing about Washington right now, uh, coming off their uh, Capitals championship, is Billy's a big Capitals fan here, but... The weirdest thing is that the Nats are 64 and 65, and they're like seven games out of uh, the wild card. They're just about cooked. What the hell's wrong with that team? I mean, you got the best pitcher in baseball, or one of the best pitchers in baseball. You got all that hitting. You got the best rookie this year in, in Soto, Bryce Harper, winning lineup all the way around, and they're 64 and 65. Bring back Dusty Baker. I think you hit it on the nose. I think the manager, the manager, new manager, Davey Martinez, has not had a good handle on this team. The toughest guy they had was Dusty Baker. And without him, they just sort of don't have a center of that team. That's not, not Bryce Harper's role yet. And there's a lot of talk that Bryce Harper's going to be moving on. The Nats tried to move him through the waiver trade process earlier this week and when the Dodgers claimed him they couldn't work out a deal with LA uh, you know, this week they moved out their starting second baseman who also is their cleanup hitter which is Daniel Murphy at the Cubs uh, they made another trade for their part-time first baseman Matt Adams went to the Cardinals is this like and a forfeiture was, of the year I mean are they throwing in the towel that's what the word is around here they made a couple moves, and suddenly they started winning again. Took two out of three from the Phillies. There just aren't enough games left. No, and if this it, is the Orioles. You'd have it down to the, you know, to the day. Orioles but is I it? I think right now the Nats have to go twenty-four and ten to have a good shot at this. The Orioles are another story for another day. But anyway, uh, another loss last night. All right, let's get into Maryland a little bit, and uh, it seems like every day there's a new story, but. One thing that when I read the story originally yesterday, I think it was in the Post, about Anderson uh, supposedly hiring a lawyer for two kids who were charged with some sexual assault. Wayne, you and I know Kevin Anderson pretty well. And Kevin Anderson was not a guy who did anything in secret. He was upfront about everything. And I just didn't believe it. And it turned out that I was right. I mean, did you ever believe that Kevin Anderson would be involved in something like that? The whole story seems fishy. Because he what wasn't even working. Like, in other words, he wasn't even involved. You know, he was, in, was he, he was on sabbatical, right? Well, he, the Kevin Anderson discretionary fund, so the athletic director has some money that he can spend on his own at his discretion. Right. Um, got this attorney involved who's a sports attorney from Montgomery, Alabama. The attorney was already on campus working on another issue. 
and he ended up helping these football players, and that bill came to $15,000, and the university did pay him. But Kevin Anderson clearly did send the then a letter to stay to cease and desist from the case on the football. But the players. lawyer said that it was Durkin who hired him. Uh, ne- he said he assumed he was working with Durkin. But neither Don Marcus nor the Washington Post article actually can figure out who hired him. He was already on retainer for the university. Hmm. So the lawyer said he was under the impression he was working with Durkin because that's the only person, Durkin and Evans, were the only people that knew he was there working on the football case at that time. So th- there's not an answer on either the Washington Post you know story what's, you know or... What's stra- you know what's strange about that? All right, you and myself know probably five or six lawyers who are involved with the university who would have done the case for nothing. In other words, you, you know who I'm talking about. I mean, not... Yes, I do. Not subterfugely, but in the open, because I've seen it happen before, where the lawyers come to the aid of Maryland students in trouble or certainly come to their defense. And I, I highly doubt that they charge for it, knowing the people who did. You know, and it just, you know... Of course, these are things I hear. These aren't things that people tell me. But uh, I just know, I just can't envision certain guys would even, you know, close to close to the pro- total program, wouldn't do it certainly on a really modified basis. Why would you go to somebody from Alabama to do it? You know, I don't, I don't get it. Well, this, according to what I, I think I know, and these days I'm not sure if you really know anything. I don't know you anything just, anymore. You know. I tell you what, I'm just reading the paper and, and getting twisted in the wind like most of the people, and uh, I have my own opinions, but, uh, you know, but the, the, the truth is... The is that, that this firm specialized in getting, making sure that athletes complied with the NCAA rules, etc., to make sure that they were eligible. So he was already on campus and already working and had a contract with the university. And I'm still not clear how he ended up working on this football case. So, but once Lowe and the rest of the team figured he was working on the football case, the university told him to stop doing so. And at that point, he had run up $15,000 in billing and the university paid him. What's unclear is what happened next, because I'm not sure he actually stopped working on that football case. Well, 250 an hour, $15,000 is 60 hours, correct? I'm pretty good with math. So he worked on it for, yeah, he worked on it for a little bit over a week. I, the whole story is just, it just does, this story will not end. And, and to me, to me, when we see Urban Meyer, get virtually nothing, nothing. Don't tell me it was a three-game suspension. It was a one-game suspension because he's allowed to prepare the team, all right? He's allowed to prepare the team in the other two games. You know, money rules the roost, as they say. And, you know, what happened with Urban Meyer, which I knew from the get-go, they would never get rid of him. I uh, even though he blatantly ignored a sexual assault from one of his staff members, had knowledge of it and did nothing about it. Uh, I just knew it would pass. And then yesterday, after not apologizing for for whatever length of time, he tweeted uh, an apology to this Courtney Smith. ESPN SEC guru Paul Feinbaum, who's kind of like the uh, how do you describe him? Like the uh, Brent Musburger, or I'm trying to think uh, who was the guy from CBS who was like the voice of sports for a long time, Jack Whitaker. All right, and Paul Feinbaum, I think everyone would agree, is like the Jack Whitaker of college football, and he just blasted Ohio State and Urban Meyer the other day, just blasted him. And Urban Meyer, three games. I don't know what's going to happen to DJ, but we're already hearing speculation about the next coach. And uh, 
I, to me, it's it's a subject that shouldn't be broached. But when I hear some of the names, it's it's it. I don't like to use. It's a joke. It's guys who would never come here. And then somebody mentioned Lane Kiffin. Who in the hell would want Lane Kiffin after all that's gone down? You know, I mean, who would want him? I don't know, Wayne. I, I would actually assume that Maryland would want him because he's big news. Of course, he'll end up being trouble if you'd ever get him here, but he would sell some tickets. I'm afraid with the, as everything moves towards the Board of Regents side, although they seem to be, as we said on the air on Wednesday, the utmost and standing very successful people who seem to love Maryland, I fear that it might turn a little more towards the academic side, and we're going to end up almost a de facto de-emphasizing football over this. Can't happen. I know you're not going to give it up. No, it can't happen. You're not going to de-emphasize football ever. You're not going to, it's not going to happen at Maryland. You're talking about a team rich in history, national champions, although 60 years ago or 70 years ago, uh, you know, ACC champs at some point. It, they're not. They're not going to de-emphasize football. They're not. It's just not going to happen. There's too much involved. Holy cow! How much do they spend on the new Cole Field Center? I mean, I two hundred, couple hundred million dollars. It, it's, it's it's never going to be de-emphasized. It could be, it could be taken down and restarted, but re de-emphasized never, never. Might take a long time to come back. Might not. No, I think the most viable guy right now is Matt Canada. Give him a chance. He has, you know, we have, we haven't taken the field yet. You know, and see what happens. You know, and uh, if Durkin, if the Durkin situation doesn't work out, you know, you got somebody there. You got you know things in place. I don't. I don't know. It's a tough one. But we're playing Texas next week, and uh, what a great, great start to the season it would be after all that happened if we could take down the Longhorns and is it going to happen Wayne could it happen oh it certainly could happen I mean what I don't uh, see a number on the game all right I really don't I've looked and looked but uh, I assume Texas would be what about a 10 point favorite a nine point favorite uh, last time I saw it it was 12 and a half 12 and a half too many points. Too many points. Despite all what's going on in Maryland, guess what? Tyrell Pagrome and Kasim Hill are healthy. Big factor. Last time we had two healthy quarterbacks against Texas. What happened, Wayne? In Austin. The last time the Maryland Terrapins won the game, beat them in many different ways. And I thought that was the high water mark, and maybe one day we'll look back and go, "Can you believe that happened?" Look, look what I'm, happened next. I'm still but, in. I'm man. still. I'm still in shock that Maryland actually beat Michigan and uh, Penn State in the same year. You know, under Randy Etzel, we can't forget about that. But uh, yeah, no, they beat but Texas a year ago. A year ago, the whole world, the whole football world, was toasting to the success of the Maryland Terrapins who went into Austin, Texas and beat them. Of course, Pogrom tore his ACL in that game and Kasim Hill came in and looked like a young gunslinger saved the day for the Turks. It was, that was a great day, Bruce. What a day. Yeah, I can't wait to see what Matt Canada, who's, he look, he comes here as a off, with a history as a offensive guru who couldn't get along with Ed Dozer on. But, I mean, he revised, he regenerated football at Pitt. And, uh, you know, he's got the name. I like his name, Matt Canada. You know, but we'll see what happens well, next if week. Well, we, if we win the game, we can sing O Canada on Wednesday night. I'll be very happy to do that, okay? I will be, I will lead the, because I know the word. You know the words to it? Of course. With uh, the hockey background, you have to know the words Oh, excuse to it. me, I forgot. Uh, well, so much for that. And again, you and me are high on basketball. I, I think it's getting better and better when you look at the depth of the team. Uh, the schedule is the schedule and it came out this week. What do you think of it? You know, it seems like 
got to go to Michigan State and we don't get a return game. There's not many no return games anymore with 20 games. There's only The max would be 26. And if you go to 26 games, you may as well call it the NBA. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> You're right on that. Which game out of that schedule is the one road game that you're focused on, on getting out to. Last year you went to Purdue. I'm going to Michigan this year. I'm going to Michigan. All right. I would, I'd like to go to Michigan State, but I understand it's a four-hour drive from Detroit. That is not going to happen with me, unless you go with me and you drive. But uh, what's, the, what's the date on that one? Michigan State is Monday, January 21st possible it's possible hopefully you will uh, be leaving baltimore after a, a playoff game yes that would and be then nice going to michigan state that would be nice but i'm definitely going to go to michigan on a saturday you'll fill in for me uh how about you what's your favorite one there i'm excited for the early season home games um what do we have uh seton hall is it and virginia comes in virginia is a big game very big game. I got another game we should go to. Oh, it's going to be tough on a Saturday. That Rutgers game, January 5th. If it's not Oh, snowing. I think we can get there. Yeah. We can drive to that with the two and a half hours up to the football stadium. So it's about the same. Well, if it's a night game, it's no problem. We can do the show, then go up. But uh, That works for me. So yeah. what do you have planned for tonight? Uh, I take it you are going to the game tonight? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a, a loyalist. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to the doubleheader today, day-night doubleheader. And, uh, you know, it's amazing, Wayne. People criticize the Oriole fans for this and for that. And I know there were a lot of Yankee fans la- there last night. But you know what? There were 26,000 people. And for the final three games of the series, they're expecting 100,000. And this is the Orioles are the worst team in baseball. And yeah, there's a lot of Yankee fans there, but there's not 20,000 Yankee fans. And, and what's the difference? Attendance is, is attendance. But I got to say that's pretty strong for a team that's 37 and 91, heading for like the worst, the end. I mean, you know, maybe as the worst team in baseball ever. Chris Davis hit a home run off Zach Britton last night. That was kind of nice, although it was meaningless. But uh, a little like two outs. Finally got a two out hit, Bruce. That's right, two out hit. He had a big two out hit in the first, no one out hit in the first inning. He got a, a single to right field to score two runs with the bases loaded off of Sabathia, and Sabathia responded. I'm not going to say he threw at him, but he he threw at him inside the next time up. Davis got knocked down. It was actually a foul ball, and he was hysterical. I mean, who in the world would throw at Chris Davis? That's like wasting a pitch. All right, why would you throw at him? But uh, I don't know. He's he's armored up there to take that hit. He's got some the uh, elbow stuff, NFL yeah. Size padding on. Yeah, for sure. Hey Wayne, we're hey, way. Uh, Go ahead. Last comment. I know we're over, but I, I just give me ten seconds. So, what do you think of this new second baseman who is is really hitting the ball well? You know what is funny? Uh, it's not funny, but I feel bad because I like Jonathan Scope. But through uh, Friday. Through Thursday, here were his numbers. In 19 games with the Brewers, Scope is batting 179 with one home run, four RBIs, and 20 strikeouts. Uh, you think the Milwaukee's wow. play they made that deal? No. Well, no. But look, uh, Villar wasn't doing what he does and what he's doing for the Orioles when he was in Milwaukee. Villar, well, sometimes like a change of scenery changed. works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, and I think Villar has been, I think he's making a push to be the everyday second baseman. And uh, two-run homer to give a lead, a 4-2 to two lead over the Yankees, that's pretty impressive. And, you know, he's got some big hits, and he, he works well out of that leadoff or second position. Uh, right now, plus the other prospects the Orioles got, that trade's looking like an outright winner. Manny, Manny or Cody Carroll yesterday, it was not his day. It was not his. Every time you looked at the Yankees lineup yesterday, holy cow, it was like, you know, is, is everybody on that team hurt? I mean. Yes, uh, they are. As somebody reads New York Post once in a while, so many guys are hurt. Look, Manny went to the Dodgers, was hitting over 300. He's cooled off to 275, and the Dodgers 
Man, the Dodgers look like they're falling off the pace. He is not. He is not. Card. He has not moved them into higher stratus. He's bad two seventy three. He's had a couple good games. He's played well, but he's not. Uh, I didn't think those guys would go over to the National League and just take over. I think that uh, getting used to the different pitching has, has been a, a factor for them. And uh, certainly the pressure that's on scope, you know, he sent over there to help take them to a wild card, and it ain't happening. Wayne, we are really out of time. Got to go. Thanks, thanks a lot for checking in, my friend, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. Go Terps. All right, buddy. All right, this is Bruce Posner. We introduce a new sponsor today. Actually, two new sponsors. Number one, it's by the same owner, however, the Valley Inn on 10501 Falls Road, 410-828-002, 2010, 2011, Teddy Bauer took that building and renovated, but kept the same historical feel. What a phenomenal, great social place to go. Happy hours, Monday through Thursday, tremendous deals. Tuesday night, I kind of love it, it's $1 oysters. Reasonable pricing on their light fare menus for lunch and dinner. Known for its tremendous assortment of seafood. Valley, the Valley Room has a 10-foot projection system. Can seat up to 85 people for your special guest. And let me tell you the main thing about the Valley Inn. It's always packed, but the atmosphere is really upbeat. It's a great place to go. You're going to see a lot of your friends from around the area here in Towson and Pikesville and Owings Mills and right in uh, even Mount Washington and Falls Road area. Uh, you're going to know so many people there, and it's just a tremendous conglomeration, of everybody. And when the weather's nice and the patio's open, the place is rocking. We thank the Valley Inn for coming in to sponsor Turp Talk and the Sports Maven. And in the nest, 410-828-0002-10501, Falls Road, the Valley Inn. Thank you for joining us. This is Bruce Posner. We'll be back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. All right, we talked about our two new sponsors, and of course, we'll go into the other one right now before we start this segment. And that, of course, is the Oregon Grill. We all know about the Oregon Grill over on 1201 Shawan Road, uh, right next to where the fireworks are every year. It's a romantic getaway located in the heart of Maryland's beautiful horse country. They, uh, they serve classic American cuisine in a luxurious, renovated 19th century stone farmhouse. Winner of the 2017 Diner's Choice Award. Uh, tremendous outdoor setting for lunch or dinner. Uh, my favorite. Now I'm eating a lot of salads these days. They have a seafood salad. It's called Seafood Cobb. That is uh, second to none in, in the town. Check out. Check out their $7 lunch specials. Every day, one a day, every day a week. Their brunch on Sunday is incredible. We know about this, the restaurant. Billy Shriver certainly uh, runs the runs the restaurant for Ted Bauer, the owner. And Ted Bauer, also owner of the Valley Inn. Just a tremendous place to take your family on a special event or just to go out with your friends and have a great time sitting outside when the weather's good. Wow, what a night. What a night tonight would be at the Oregon Grill. Gorgeous, gorgeous night in the 60s and uh, a super night to go to the Oregon Grill. 410-771-0505 and they're on 1201 Chiron Road. And we thank the Oregon Grill for joining uh, the Sports Maven and Turp Talk family. And uh, look forward to our relationship with them and eating there a lot and seeing all my good friends there. All right. I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about the NFL. And the first thing I want to say is Nick Foles. Nick Foles, Billy, I don't know if you watched it the other night, was absolutely horrendous. Did not look good. That's he was sure. absolutely horrendous against the Browns. Might be one of the most boring seasons or preseason games I've ever seen. Yes, it was hard to watch. But, of course, I was watching it for uh, Johnny, for uh, Baker Mayfield. Of course. And... Uh, he was okay that day, but now it looks like Tyrod might be out. And Baker might be starting. Now Baker got dinged up a little bit too, so Tyrod's it, the hand, right? Yeah, Tyrod might be out, but uh, let's hope both of them are ready. But 
I have to tell you something. It's not a it's not a great way to open up your career. No, definitely not. All right, against Pittsburgh and and uh, but I've been impressed with Baker Mayfield. He's not looked too bad. Yeah, not looked too bad. Steady, very steady. Yes, and of course. Getting to the Ravens, and matter. Ravens face the Dolphins tonight at 7 o'clock in Miami. Talked to my brother. Can't wait to go tonight. Big Dolphins fan in Florida. But anyway, it does seem like a foregone conclusion now that RG3 will make the squad. Even Harbaugh said something yesterday about it. You think he will make the squad? Yes, he will I, make the squad. I and would I, agree. I think it's because we've come to the conclusion, and not surprisingly, that Lamar Jackson is just not ready. He's not. And, and I think it's the smart thing to do. Bring three. You never know what happens. Then if RG3 goes down, then you got a third person there. But I think that is the right call. I would yeah, I mean, well. RG3s look good, certainly serviceable. And uh, although Lamar Jackson, they say, will, will be in a couple packages for opening day. And that'll be really interesting. Probably because it's home. Yes, all right? yeah. Probably. probably because it's home. But that will be fun. It's another reason to go to the game. But... We got hit by bad news this week. Not two, a good week. Two injuries to two of the most crucial parts of the uh, offense. Neither of them, one of them is semi-serious, and that's to Hayden Hurst. He is out for three to four weeks and uh, with a stress fracture in his foot. Yeah, I don't know. And that's I, scary when you that hear that. That is scary. I, I don't buy the whole three to four weeks thing, unfortunately. I think it's going to be a little bit closer to five to six. Uh, it's sad to me because we know how much Joe likes his tight ends. So I, I was really looking forward to seeing Hayden out there. Uh, unfortunately, that is going to have to wait. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, and of course, Ronnie Stanley, minor injury. Uh, he seems like he'll be okay, but we will not see him in the next two weeks. No, no, I think I think that's another that's a very like Yanda situation. We'll see him week one. I, I think we won't see him in the coming weeks. Five exhibition games is too many. Five is a lot. Two's too many. Uh, then again, you gotta say I, I think Harbaugh said it best the other day. It's good practice for the start of the season with that week one, week two back to back with the Bengals uh, on that Thursday night. So it, it's a nice uh, kind of practice, but five is a lot. Five is way too many, and uh, I think uh, they're getting when, when Belichick lost his first draft pick uh, tackle. To me, that's the sign that. Uh, Everybody started talking about this has got to come to an end. Yeah. This has got to stop because you're going to lose guys every week anyway. And just to add one more to it, in something that's totally meaningless. And you got to. Although some would argue every game is totally yeah, meaningless. That's, a, that's, a that's fair another point way to too. look at it. But uh, fair point. whatever. Uh, I'm concerned. Here's some stats on Joe Flacco we were talking during the break. Right on me. All right. The ninth worst yards per pass attempt in the past decade of 5.72 belongs to Joe Flacco's season last year. It sounds about right. 5.72. It was every play a check down? Uh, it's, I was there for a lot of them. I got to say, it sure seemed like it. It got real rough there towards the end of the season, too. Then you have, in the past four seasons... He's had a total of 92 TDs and interceptions. Your guess was great. So I'll give everybody out there listening a second to put 92. Come up with a number that you think would be uh, acceptable. And it's not going to be what Joe did. All right. Joe had 52 TDs and 40 interceptions. That is scary. It's not great. And I'm a Joe Flacco guy. And I, I love Joe Flacco, great. but... Uh, He's got to improve, my man. He does. He And this is it. This is his season. And I think he knows that. I, I think he's well aware of the facts. I think he knows that they're pretty high on Lamar. Uh, if there's a season to go have, it's going to be this one, i got to say. Yeah, well, Joe's on his contract year. We all remember what happened last time he was in his contract That's year. That's true. Came up with uh, a Super Bowl, a great run that he's – I hate to say he's kind of lived off of it. But he, no, he has. He, he has lived off. Has. And you know what? You can make a case that, yeah – you can live off a Super Bowl More run. More power to him. I got to say, he made his money. Although I'm not sure Nick Foles is going to live <laughs> off the Super Bowl. I mean, he had two of the greatest games ever uh, in the championship game and in the Super Bowl. But to say that watching him in the past two games, it almost looks like they've... You know, we talk about football a lot. And the one thing you have to remember, whenever there's like the new wrinkle, the new thing... Nick Foles was the new thing. It takes 
these guys who do nothing but watch film, look for weaknesses, and they now know that if you put pressure on Nick Folds, all right, after these games, he falls like an accordion. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what, happened. and that's what it looks like. That's what it looked like, and right. you, and that that kind of scares me if I'm an Eagles fan, because if I'm an Eagles fan, I don't want them rushing back Carson Wentz. I, I, I don't want. They can. I saw you saw him the other day. He looks like he can't move. Hey, yeah. So I mean, what are you left with at that point? You got Foles. You're left you got with a, Nick Foles. You got to roll with him for a little bit. I, maybe things will change. It is exhibition, but. You know, shut out by the Browns, but it wasn't even shut out. He threw two <laughs> interceptions and two picks, and I mean, everything he did was bad. He did throw a couple nice passes, but uh, he got fell. He slipped, fell down in the end zone, Sweet. got up, threw a beautiful pass, but he was ruled down. Yeah, it was close. It was close, but uh, that's a that's a hockey score there, Bruce. <laughs> listen, listen. His performance made uh, Lamar Jackson look great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lamar Jackson had an A because Nick Foles was F minus, uh, and yeah, there is concern in Philadelphia, big time, big time. I would agree, big time about uh, Nick Foles. But so the uh, the Ravens go into Game One. Funny thing about the Ravens: two things happened over the past two weeks. Number one, originally they were eight eight, eight games o- over and under. Now. Eight games over and under means if they win nine, you win your bet. If you win eight, you tie. They win seven, you lose. Well, guess what happened? It moved to eight and a half. That's the biggest half game you can move. But now you lose at eight, and you still have to get nine to win. Sure do. All right, now also, all preseason long, when I first saw the line for the opening week back in uh, May, all right, six, it was three points. The Ravens were over Buffalo. It's now six and a half. Okay. Okay. That's that's a leap of monumental proportions. Yeah. So, wow. Three and a half point rise in that spread for opening day. Uh, opening day greatly anticipated. It's a shame we play the Redskins in exhibition when nobody's going to play. No. Yeah. You're gonna- and you know what? You, what you look, I looked at the Sun Papers this morning, and they had their breakdown of who's going to make the team and who's not. And when you take a look at it, it's almost like they play the entire preseason with 90 guys, and maybe two of them have a chance of making the team that's not already set. Right. Like, you knew Mark Andrews was going to make the team when yeah. they drafted him as another tight end. You you knew, you know, number one, two. The, the first three or four picks, they're not going to admit that they were wrong. It would have to be a disaster to say, hey, we were wrong. Exactly. All right? Yeah, Brashad Perriman's on the bubble. Bubble, so, yes. Something tells me they're going to keep him. I'm not sure. After Lashley dropped that touchdown pass yeah, from RG3. Yeah, that was not good. No, that was not a good look. <laughs> Wide it, open. You can't be. It's Especially in the preseason. Yeah, I mean, he's got two games left to try and turn that around. Cannot be doing that. And he's lucky because he's going to get RG3 for a half. Yes. And he'll have a chance. RG3 is a quarterback. Yes. He's not somebody in, in, you know, who's like training or whatever. RG3 can make those passes to make him look better. But one more drop, he may as well just leave just, the stadium. Yeah, it's not worth it. That's Go out really, to South Beach and have a good time. Really, really bad, bad time for a drop. Because the days are numbered for him. I just like this segment is numbered for me. We're out of time. we got to go to our second break. This is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. And as a reminder, in the nest starts on September 9th, opening day for the Ravens against Buffalo. We're going to come back and take a look at college football, the top 10. We've been talking so much college football, college football trauma. Let's get into what teams are going to be there, who are the best, and uh, I'll bring in my college football guru to help me with that subject. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. Take a quick aside and uh, in golf in the Northern Trust, the first of the... The first of the playoffs of the uh, FedEx Cup. Who else but Brooks Kepka in the lead, minus 10. DJ's minus 8, but the field is bunched. Adam Scott's right in there as well at, uh, I think, minus 9. But Brooks Kepka, look out when he's in the lead 
and it's a big tournament. We're talking about a potential in two week ten million dollar payout. Look out for Brooks. All right. Here we go with our final segment. I'll bring in my college football guru. Uh, knows as much as anybody in my eyes, and that's my intern and my buddy Mason, Mason Viner. Mason, welcome in today, my friend. It's good to be here, Bruce. How are you doing? Doing great. We're going to go down the gauntlet. I now want to take, give you the final minute to talk about Maryland, Texas next week. But let's talk about some football. And uh, number one, of course, Alabama Crimson Tide still has the quarterback controversy, correct? Yeah, it's Tua against Jalen Hurts. For me, I would pick Jalen Hurts. I just like how he's led them to back-to-back college football playoffs. But then on the other hand, you got the guy that won you the championship, but it's all about the defense for Alabama, and you know they're going to be great. Might be, could there be a problem? You got your third defensive coordinator in three years, in four seasons, rather, after Jeremy Pruitt left. The talent's still there. It's just the way they establish you know, that work ethic. And I'm seeing it right now on the Redskins, where we have Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, two Alabama guys. They're just on another level. Their work, the way they just show all that power is just, it gives you all the reasons why that Alabama defense is so great. Yeah, well, the Terps have had tremendous success with uh, Alabama defenders. All right, number two in the nation, Clemson. Your take on Clemson. Another team with quarterback controversy, Kelly Bryant against an incoming freshman. Kelly Bryant said the other day, three days ago, that he said that he deserved the starting job. Now, if he doesn't get it, I think that could cause big problems throughout that locker room. But Dabo Sweeney is constantly proving himself as one of the best in college football. Uh, Travis Atien, Heisman, possible? I don't know. The Heisman field this year, I think it's pretty wide open. There are a lot of guys that the Heisman odds makers are predicting to make big jumps like Justin Herbert from Oregon or Jacob Fromm from Georgia. They really didn't have Heisman seasons last year, but the expectation is that they're stepping it up to the next level. A dark horse could definitely win it this year. Yeah, Travis Hady, and you give him a step, he's gone. I mean, he, the speed is incredible. I love him. Georgia picked third by, uh, I think this is the ESPN poll. Yeah, Bruce, you're talking about another team where people want the backup quarterback in the game. They brought in the number one quarterback, Justin Fields, and, of course, the freshman from last year, Jacob Fromm. It looks like Fromm's going to get the job. That's what I would do. Don't throw a freshman out there. Stay with the guy that led you to the college football playoff. Other than that, you have a team that lost some key guys with Raquan Smith, the defensive end. They're going to have some things to replace, but the way Kirby Smart recruits at this point, they can definitely do it. Tremendous success at Georgia. And then, of course, Urban Meyer, going to miss the first three games, or first first game anyway, uh, for Ohio State. And uh, an ex-Maryland guy, Dwayne Haskins, will be the starting job, and won the starting job at quarterback. Can he, can he take them to the promised land? Definitely, Bruce. Dwayne Haskins, another guy that's in that Heisman conversation. For Ohio State, those first three games, you only got one that I would be concerned about. They play against TCU. As for the rest of the team, they have my best pass rusher in the country in Nick Bosa, brother of Joey Bosa. As always, the defense is looking strong. And, you know, when you can recruit like that, there's always going to be someone to step up on offense. But one guy to look for is Paris Campbell, the wide receiver. All right, we drop to number five. He's Baker Mayfield is gone onto the Cleveland Browns, but Oklahoma is still – still uh, picked high, and Lincoln Riley's done a great job replacing Bob Stoops. Yeah, Lincoln Riley, I, in my opinion, one of the best young coaches in all of college football. This year under center, you will see Kyler Murray. He went to Texas A&M, was the number one quarterback recruit. Now he's at Oklahoma, where he got to back up Baker Mayfield last year. I think he's ready to get back on the field. As for the defense, you know, it's a classic Big 12 defense. They're going to give up points to all about who they can shoot out. You know, it's funny. Uh, early big game, they play Florida Atlantic. That could be very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, that's week one. I'm looking forward to Florida Atlantic because I love the, what Lane Kiffin's doing. I love him bringing in all those guys off the Netflix shows. It's just a great team to watch. All right, Wisconsin, always in the hunt. Pick number six right now. Uh, Alex Hornbrook returns. And uh, another Heisman possibility, Jonathan Taylor. 
Yeah, Bruce, Jonathan Taylor is one of my favorite players in college football. Really smart guy. For the quarterback, Alex Hornbrook, he's got to be better. He's got to be able to make some big throws down the line. He can't turn the ball over in big situations. But, man, do I love myself some Wisconsin defense. They're made by that state. They always have seniors that will walk on to come up every year, and they're fun to watch. For a real football guy, they're a really fun team to watch because they're so – their technique is so sound that it's really just a good team to watch. Uh, agreed. They're always in the hunt, and thank, thank heavens Maryland doesn't have to play them this year. All right? they, we've drawn them, what, the past three years? It's been ridiculous. Uh, the Washington Huskies, Chris Peterson, done a great job there. Yeah, Chris Peterson, the guy that led Boise State to those 12-0 seasons, really did a great job of rebuilding that Washington program. And I actually got to go look at their campus this summer, really beautiful football stadium. They returned Heisman hopeful Jake Browning. They were in the college football playoffs two years ago. They kind of had some rough patches last year. But that defense that Peterson brings always has really talented NFL guys. I just don't think they've ever really been able to put it together on the defensive side of the ball. But Jake Browning's going to have to be great for them to win a lot of games this year because the Pac-12 just seems to be getting tougher and tougher. Well, I'm going to skip Auburn because we're running out of time. I want to hear your take on Notre Dame. They're now up to number nine in the country. Is that over? They're always overhyped. Yeah, of course they're always overhyped, but they do have a great quarterback in Brandon Winbush. They just got to get him out of the pocket, give him situations where he can run. And Brian Kelly is an offensive guru, so I'm sure they can get that offense going. And finally, number 10, Penn State. Penn State, Penn State's was, got big shoes to fill. Of course, they lost Saquon Barkley. But the backup running back is a guy that I've always liked, Miles Sanders. He's not quite Saquon Barkley, but he does have a great first step, can break some tackles. It's going to be a lot more on Trace McSorley this year, the quarterback. As for the defense, they're strong. They have a lot of talent, but they did lose a lot of guys last year. So for Penn State and James Franklin, they're going to have to pick it up in some places this year. Are you a Trace McSorley fan, their quarterback? I'm not a fan of him, Bruce, but he does make some nice plays. But without Saquon Barkley, it's a whole new game for him. It's amazing. No matter who the quarterback is for Penn State, there's always the Penn State people always doubt him, and he's like not a he's not like uh, overly popular at Penn State. I mean, he's popular because he's a quarterback, but fans aren't in love with him. But when you have a running back like that, oh, that I could quarterback. Can run, I mean, there's it. It makes it a lot easier. Without question. Finally, I'm going to give you the final minute. Right now, you said, you know, Wayne said I haven't seen a line on the game, but Maryland supposedly is a 12 point dog against uh, uh, Texas. You don't see that, do you? No, I don't see that. I actually see the Terps coming out, being able to win that game. With all this happened, which, with all that's happened, offense, yeah. I mean, um. I'm loving what I'm seeing from that quarterback position. The wide receivers, for me, are the biggest question on the team. And you do have a lot of new guys on defense, like Cowart and the Lewis brothers. It's going to be a lot of gelling for both sides of the ball, for both teams. For Texas, they go with Sam Ellinger, the sophomore at quarterback. That was announced this past week for Tom Herman. They lost the guy that really did the most damage to Maryland with Reggie Hemphill Maps, so they're going to have to find another guy to make big plays. Tom Herman thinks he has the guys, but he thought he had the guys last year. Let's see how it works for Texas. Texas, I, you know, Tom, Tom Herman, he's not on the hot seat, but lose again to Maryland, you're going to start hearing rumblings. There's no well, when you lost to Maryland last year, there were rumblings, Bruce. People, you know, it's Texas. They don't expect to lose to Maryland. And if they do again this year, especially with what's going on at Maryland, and they have a season, another 6-6 six and six year, there are definitely going to be some people that want him gone. Oh, he'll be gone, unless he's, like, tied up in a contract. But I don't think Texas cares about that. Mason, thanks a lot for coming on. We love your expertise. And uh, may I tell everybody out there listening, he had no idea of what teams I was going to say. I guess he could figure Clemson and Alabama, but that knowledge is known. Not you know, Mine is known from my notes. His is known from knowledge. So, uh, Mason, thanks a lot for coming on, my friend. Thanks for having me, Bruce. All right. That's going to do it for today. Bruce Posner signing off. Drive safely. Have a great weekend. Enjoy this weather. Get out to the Oregon Grill tonight. Order the Valley Inn. You'll love them. Have a good day. Have a good week, everyone.